Today we're joined by the head coach of the England Wheelchair Rugby League. Um, you, you're a sports participation officer, is that right, for Medway Council? Yeah, so my full-time role is a sports participation officer at Medway Council. Uh, I do that full-time along with a role with um, a national charity called Street Games, which is around um, raising participation in sport in disadvantaged areas. Is that the actual job title or is that... Right. Is the no, it's kind of for that. <laughs> yeah, so the actual my actual title at Street Games is uh, doorstep sports advisor. Ooh, not too bad. Uh, did you say you was involved with some of the women's rugby? Yeah, so I'm uh, also head coach of um, the Great Britain women's um, seniors tag squad as well. So I was um, coaching at the World Cup last yeah. year in Australia, where we got the bronze medal. So yeah, keeping myself busy. Yeah, God, you are. You put me to shame, mate. <laughs> And uh, my last tip I've got, well, point of fact I've got here on uh, Mark Ruff's Edge is he's actually a Warrington fan for all of you that are listening. And you'll be happy to know that the, well, you'll be overjoyed, won't you, that Warrington have finally got a team in the wheelchair. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Fantastic to see uh, my hometown um, team participating in sport. Pity I can't coach and being uh, all the way down south. So um, really good to see uh, a big brand like Warrington Wolves involved and it's, uh, it's great to see more Super League clubs involved in the sport now. I, I got to meet a couple of the Warrington lads as well. They're, they're really sort of, they're really um, like passionate about what they're doing. You can, you can see there's a real drive for it as well. So the, the fingers crossed everything's going to be good because we've seen the horror stories before with, with clubs that set up in the past and, and the funding wise and things like that. But I think Warrington are uh, I've got a good drive behind them. I think they're going to do well, to be fair, do you? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, Warrington are obviously um, a big part of the community there, really knitted into the community. And if they're going to do something, they'll do something properly. Uh, I know Neil Kelly and the team will do a really good job there. And uh, it's going to be a massive honour for anyone from Warrington to pull that shirt on. And that's, uh, that's why I think it's going to be successful. It's going to uh, open up an opportunity for lots of people to... Uh, on the primrose and blue where they wouldn't have been able to do so before so it's exciting times for the sport and exciting times uh, for people in the town of Warrington yeah so we'll uh, we'll get into my topics I've got my list down here anyway so we've got uh, first I just wanted to ask so I obviously know when when you started playing uh, well, getting involved in wheelchair rugby league and stuff like that but can you just <laughs> tell the the viewers and listeners how how you actually started getting involved in wheelchair rugby league and how you found it? Yeah, so um, I was um, in a role as a Kent um, rugby league community coach uh, down here in Medway and one of my remits was to start up a sport I'd never heard of before in wheelchair rugby league. So um, not a lot to go off uh, and a big task in front of me. So uh, we started off the club, I think it was in 2011, 2012. Um, so got involved setting up the club and... Um, Got really passionate about the game and its values and um, got involved um, as an England assistant shortly afterwards. So it was uh, a really quick kind of um, initiation for me, but um, I, I quickly got involved in the sport and, and loved it. Mm. So do you, um, yeah, you just touched on, so you you, um, you got into the assistant coach role and that was under uh, Phil I was going to say Robert. I was going to say Phil Knight. Then I don't know why I had Phil Knight in my head. <coughs> Phil Roberts, you know, taught me half of the things I know about bloody rugby league. Forgot his last name. That's for... anyway. So yeah, you you spend your time in as a, a assistant coach for England. That how was that as an experience from what you were doing before in terms of the community size? Someone's just obviously put a put a job on your desk and said do this and then it, it's blown up and, and now you, all of a sudden you're an assistant coach for an international team in, in wheelchair rugby league. Yeah, I think I've worked um, a lot on um, performance pathways in the past with um, Harlequins, uh, London Broncos and Warrington. So there's a lot of transferable skills in terms of working um, with talented players uh, and players on a pathway. But in terms of a, a full international role, yeah, that was my first first role so it was really tough at, at first it was um, a lot of sitting back uh, watching and um, seeing how the team knitted together and, and just trying to work out a way for me to add value to that um, set up which, which took me a while to be honest um, I sat back and to um, add value where I seen 
So it was a, a really interesting journey. Learned a lot along the way. And um, a lot of the learnings I've put into my uh, coaching now as head coach. So I learned a lot along the way. Just that dealing with people. Uh, working out what kind of things transferred over. So there's a lot of similarities between the games, as you know. Um, it's just working out which ones fitted the best, to be honest. And I, I, I was actually quite happy when you became assistant coach because we, we had a couple of assistant coaches in the past which weren't really down to earth and and they sort of came in and were I'm not like uh, bashing anyone in the past sort of thing I can't even remember any any of the names to be fair but like you you came in and and were uh, a mate kind of thing if that makes yeah. sense you know you you were someone that were easy to talk to easy to come across it it was almost like you were one of the squad when you went at that time in the the assist when you was doing the assistant coaching so at that so while while that was going on, that was all in preparation for the twenty thirteen World Cup, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I can't just, remember uh, any of the uh, games to be injected. fair. Yeah, just injecting into the conversation. I think that was part of my learning process where you're talking about me um, becoming one of the squad. I think it was important that I got close to you guys and trying to kind of work out how you're ticking. That was a uh, and that was a big learning for me of understanding how people work and to deliver the same message in a different way to different people. So it was. Um, you know, real, real good part of my journey that was getting to know you guys. So it's good. I think the um, uh, play, players sort of recognise when new staff are coming in and things like that. It's, it's a daunting thing for a, a new management or, or, or coach or anything like that coming into someone somewhere new because they know you new you and you've got a. You, if you turn around and start bollocking everybody and like saying what what are you eating that for, what are you drinking that for, what are you you doing all that sort of, whereas you you sort of went like, how do you do things, what are you doing, and so why don't you try this and 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 sort of really getting players to think about what they're doing rather than just dictating to them. I, I, I quite like that that way of thinking of things of making players make their own changes. Yeah, definitely. I think that's an approach I like to take. I think um, at the end of the day, you guys are the ones uh, pushing out on the pitch, aren't they? So you've got a better view than me and you've got a better understanding than me. So it's, it'd be silly not to use the expertise in that in, in that group to uh, to improve you. It's just trying to pull out some learning from you and, and trying to improve two or three things. Yeah. So the, the World Cup 2013, for those of you who didn't see it, that was uh, the final was England versus France, as usual. And the... France ended up beating us by two or four. So we're trying <laughs> two or four. The uh, the story behind that is apparently there was some mistake on the the scoreboard. But um, how do you see the difference in um, how the sport is played now internationally compared with 2013? Um, I think the game is more aligned to the sport of rugby league, if that makes sense. So I think it's. Um... I think in recent times the trends have changed and it's all about that territorial game now where I think in the past it was kind of reliant upon that um, athleticism. I think there was a lot of athleticism in the past. It was kind of the freak skill won the, won the show on the day, if that makes sense. I think now it's a lot more than that. It's a bit more of a tactical battle and, um, and to use a rugby league term, it's winning that arm wrestle to win the right to play rugby league in the right areas of the field. So I think it's a lot more tactical these days. Um, I don't know from your perspective, Jack, but I think that's what I see the biggest difference between the final in 2017 and 2013 and the game's come a long way. So oh, it's definitely- yeah, I, can, I completely agree with that. With the um, Even at domestic level, if you look at um, Halifax, our team, we've, we've sort of carried ourselves on, on the abilities of Wayne and myself being able to to break a line and, and beat somebody one on one, but now the everyone across the board is sort of playing a high standard of defence and they're playing a high standard of attacking rugby league as well. Now it's the the gaps and the things to exploit aren't available to myself, Wayne, or Holmes and things like that. So it, it's relying on us to now start thinking of a different way of playing. And, and it, I, I think if if it hadn't a change changed, sorry, if it hadn't changed. I don't think, I think I'd still be that player that never passed the ball and just tried to smash through a bloody gap, you know what I mean? Yeah, I think that kind of works. I think that's the difference, isn't it? That worked in 2013, 2017. It's about 
how do we man- manipulate the defence to allow that sort of thing to happen? So we're having to work for gaps now where there was gaps all over the field in 2013, wasn't there? So yeah, it's, uh, really interesting times. And um, after 2013, we, we ended up, you started your partnership with Mr. Martin Gill. Good times, yeah. Yeah. Very good times. Um, obviously, uh, he's, he's left now um, after the last World Cup. Uh, to go and pursue his own business sort of thing. What what he's been doing is, is doing really well from what I've seen anyway. But what what do you think worked well between you and Martin? Because it was the first time I've anywhere he- heard of a, a two head coaches coaching one team sort of thing. And I imagine from the outside, people would think that that's never going to work. There's no one one boss, one this, one, one person doing that. How did you actually make it work? Because it did. But how did you make it work? I just think there was a hell of a lot of respect between us. I think we were both really energetic and really passionate about, um, first and foremost, making people better and then making them better rugby league players on the back of that. So I think our vision and our um, philosophies were really aligned. Um, I caught up with him the other day, actually, on the phone, so we still keep in touch. Um, I think we just made it work. I think... You'll probably see now in, in my role as, as head coach alone, I'll probably do things slightly differently. So I think we kind of, where we do things a little bit differently, I think we, we kind of um, compensated for each other and just understood uh, each other's approach. So I don't think we very rarely disagreed on a lot of things. So I think it just helped that, that massive respect and, um, and that ability to look at it um, through a different pair of eyes and, and engage each other's opinion. So we, we just made it work somehow. And I think it was definitely built on that respect and, um, and kind of same views and opinions on the game. I think the, the England side as themselves sort of mirrored you two as well in, in their performances and, and how they acted as well sort of thing. They, I remember the, especially the Euros, we, there was a lot of more close, close together and we were all really close-knit at that point. And there was a, a big push for us all to really have we really needed to have each other's back sort of thing because um i won't go too much into it we the a lot of we lost a lot of players before 2015 before the the europeans um and I, I won't i won't be naming names or anything like that but the how was that pressure wise for with you knowing it obviously martin gill might not have he knew what was going on but you knew the the ins and outs of it and and what was happening how how did that affect how things were going on i think it was very difficult and pretty daunting at the start but um i think my beliefs as a coach is i want people that kind of want to work together and work for the badge so you know the doors always open for anyone that wants to get on board get on board the england bus and um, and and add some value first and foremost as a good person and then um as a good player so i think i just we just stuck to our values and um we rolled the tough times just through through knowing that we had people that wanted to be on board and we were just going to try and get the best out of those people we had available. And um, fast forward onto 2015, we, we kind of did the job against France, didn't we? So I guess what got us through it is um, knowing that, that people we picked really wanted to be there and um, we was only working with people that wanted to, uh, to add value to the England badge at that time. And, and that's what it was all about. It wasn't about personalities, it was just about um, people being on board that bus towards uh, that 2015 at the time. Yeah, it was about about rugby league, wasn't it? And uh, I mean, I, I, I'll hold my hand, I think I, I've told you in the past kind of thing, that I was, I was, in, I, I, I was partly involved in, in this boycott at, at the same time, putting my hand up to that. But the, it were a tough time for me personally in that, in that sense, sort of bouncing between... Right? Do I do I follow this route, or or do I stick and 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 do this route sort of thing? Because and there there was there were one point, and it's uh, it, it speaks credit to Martin. We it was the second second England camp when when this were all going on sort of thing, and we're just doing a drill, and I was up against Ryan, of all people at the moment, and. It was just a one-on-one. You had to had the ball, and you had to try and get past them. And when I was pushing up, I, I was beating him maybe fifty percent of the time, or something like that. And Gilly just came past the back of me, and all he said was, 
switch the ball into the other hand. Something as simple as a you know a normal rugby league thing that probably loads of running rugby league guys know sort of thing. And, and I did. I think I think I beat Ryan like four times on the trot after that. And it was like that was a kind of point for me when I was like, no, I need to be on board in the England sort of thing. This is I, I'm not in this for personal game. I'm in this for the the team sort of thing. And I think that really pushed through in, in yours and Gilly's way of coaching when we were doing that 2015. And it really sort of cemented in uh, some root values for all the players involved and pushed that onto domestic levels as well. Yeah, I think that was really important for us. I mean, getting, probably to add on what I was saying before about getting through those tough periods, I think knowing we had the, uh, the backing of um, the management and, and the RFL at the time, I think... You know, they really backed us and we felt it was really important to create that, that Club England environment. It was just about England, it wasn't about anybody else. And giving you guys the best opportunity to perform in an England shirt and add value to it, and that was important to us. And, and I, I think that belief got us through through those tough periods, definitely. I mean, how did it feel for you, both sides of the fence? Well, uh, Sebastian said it yesterday, uh, all you've got to do is look at my reaction to the wind, don't you? It's... I don't think I've ever reacted to a win like that kind of thing. And it were, I, I felt like I was uh, probably sim- similar to how you felt because knowing what was going on and what, what, what the deal was and who we'd lost and, and the odds against us as, and, and things like that. And it was, it was one of those kind of, it was kind of an unbelievable thing. But it was, Sort of going into it, and I was like, I, I, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, like, who are we kidding? We've got a completely new team. We've got all these new players, never played internationally for England, and, and hats off to all of them because they all played their asses off and 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 played amazing rugby league. But it was like, it was it, it was just overwhelming, really, wasn't it? it was... Yeah, yeah, it was. I am. Um, it was a pretty special moment, wasn't it? I... It was just that moment, wasn't it? I'm not sure. It was, it was kind of the process they got just doing the journey we got us through, and, and that winning was just icing on the cake. I don't think any of us expected I'm, that. I'm really happy you said that, the process. I'm really happy you said that. Because yeah. the, the go to quote for the 2017 World Cup is always trust the process. And we had that through 2015 as well, trust, trust the process kind of thing of, of everyone just trusting in each other and, and, and getting on and playing rugby league. Yeah. Yeah, just always, amazing. Always trust the process. Yeah, definitely. And that, just, just to see us together at the end there in 2015, an incredible journey, wasn't it? And definitely one we earned and we deserved, I think, definitely. Yeah, and uh, so we, we, we carried on moving upwards, or onwards and upwards. Everyone's developed. We've got a couple of new players coming in, things like that. And then we get faced with another mountain to overcome, which is 2017 World Cup. Yeah. And it was rope it to begin with, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it was a very, uh, very tough start. I think probably just rewinding to 2016, the home nations, it was pretty, if we're totally honest, it was quite an uninspirational campaign, wasn't it really, in terms of, um, it, I think it was anything that was going to follow 2015 was always going to be a bit of a downer, wasn't it? So Yeah. I think we kind of suffered that. Um, 2016 was a bit of a low. It wasn't a, a massive low. It was just kind of a dip, wasn't it, for us? And and starting at 2017, yeah, it was tough. I think it overspilled and we needed to uh, kick ourselves and be honest and kick ourselves at the backside, didn't we, I think, after that first session. Yeah, you, you find that a lot with um, after a win or after a streak and things like that, you, you, you find complacency, don't you? I mean, I don't think that was actually the case kind of thing of, being complacent in, in, in what we were doing, but it were a lot of um, just needed to be in and amongst it playing, didn't we? It was uh, Martin Coyd says it all the time, doesn't it? Just just play the game, just get the game played and get it done. That I just don't think twenty sixteen there, there weren't quite enough of that. Even at, even at domestic level, there was a lot of crap going on in, in the domestic level and games weren't getting played and things like that and and I think the that has a knock on effect on different levels of the sport doesn't it but uh, 2017 we went in there and the first game was against France just to 
sort of back us up in first game we played was against France, wasn't it? And I can't remember the, the score. I think I blanked it out. Do, do you even remember what the score were? No, no, no. I remember us getting a bit of a walloping for a period of the game. We got a but good walloping, uh, didn't, we? didn't we? It ended up coming quite close, didn't it? We were cut, like I think we only ended up losing by about twelve points or something like that. Yeah, after a, after um, a bit of a walloping at the start. <laughs> And I remember talking to, no, I say, I'll, I'll rephrase that. I remember shouting at you and, you and Martin while, while we was playing sort of thing. And, and we went insane. We didn't want to show us cards, didn't we? Yeah. And yeah. I remember shouting at you. I was like, we need to do better. <laughs> and I was like, I just hated the fact that we, we was losing kind of thing. And it, it's not the case of losing on purpose, but it, it's a kind of, we're, we're doing things, we're not, showing our hand and I think that that's a that was a good game plan from 2015 because when we were doing the Euros that that first game the Keatley Fasoletti Cup really turned France inside out didn't we oh we blew them off the park didn't we they weren't expecting that it was a brand new style wasn't it and it was dramatically different from what we'd played before wasn't it so it definitely caught by a surprise didn't it yeah, and, and and going into the World Cup, we had we had our game plan sort of thing of what what we were going to be to be doing, but we didn't use it until maybe we. I think we practiced it like once or twice in in the semi final, didn't we, against Australia? Yeah. And the and then the final ended up with four points, wasn't it, that we lost? Yeah, yeah, tough tough one to take that, wasn't it? Yeah, that was tough a really one. tough one, and. Uh, I, I, when I were talking to Seb yesterday, I were going through all the videos and things. I found that one that, that it's going around all the time, and it was one that Gilly had uh, edited and put words on it. And oh, I can't even remember what the words are now. That's stupid. It were remember the speech Gilly gave us before we we did the work. We, we went to the final. Yeah, he put all of his speech on, on this picture and it, after the World Cup, and it was the one when Seb's like crying his eyes out and I'm like grabbing him and we both like got battle scars and, and pretty iconic moment that wasn't it <laughs> oh yeah never forget it and and it's the best thing about the 2017 and I don't care what anyone says the best thing by far about 2017 final was straight afterwards there was an interview with Wayne Boardman and he cried he actually cried Wayne doesn't cry so um, yeah. it it was a special moment. It was, yeah, and I think that was quite a poignant moment, didn't it? It, it, it kind of shown out up far. We came as a group. I think we took it. We took the momentum from 2015. There was a bit of a pause in 16, wasn't there? But we definitely uh, got back on track 2017. And I think if we're quite honest, you know, we punched above our weight in a, in, a, in a lot of ways, didn't we? I think we, we pushed ourselves beyond the limit, didn't we? And, and we did the best we could. Um, yeah, in a situation where the uh, how many, how many French fans were there? I mean, they were they hated our guts and they were screaming at us the whole time and shouting. That, yeah. That's something we have, we haven't really come across in in, in an, an obscure environment as well. So kind of thing. It, it was a lot to ask of, of the players and 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 what was going on. But yeah, I mean, I was sat in the middle of it, wasn't I? As you know, I sit up there with me my little microphone and uh, yeah, it was difficult to hear at times. But it was. It was great to see so many fans passionate about our sport, though, is the bigger picture, isn't it? As yeah, you've got to look at the bigger picture, yeah. Seeing yeah, I mean, it was outstanding, wasn't it? A couple of full stands there, thousands of people, loads of people on um, streaming. I, I think that that World Cup took the sport to a new level, didn't it? They did a really good job there in France. Yeah. You played so a now, major part. So now it's our job to take it another step in 2021, then? Yeah, talk about um, game changes. This is going to be absolutely massive, isn't it? And what a journey we've got in front of us. I know, um, it gives me goosebumps thinking about it. The, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, we've got BBC involved, RFL have took a, 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 a now upped their involvement in what's going on out there. I know that you get a lot of headaches from, from the RFL and, and, and with the selections and, and all the trainings that, that are going on. But like everything sort of, been dialed up to 10 now hasn't it oh massively and i think it's uh, it's something we've probably needed if we're honest we're getting challenged on everything now and we have to not that we didn't justify it before but we're actually having to really think about what we're doing now with this um 
we're going to an exciting place. The RFL are investing a lot of resources into us. So um, over the next two years, it's really exciting to see what all that resource and hard work gets us. And uh, there's a big prize there, isn't it? The Liverpool, um, the MS Bank Arena. In yeah. We've got to get there first, don't we? Yeah, I can't wait. I, I was talking with uh, J- James about it. He says the venue, he's, been to, he's obviously been to the venue to see it. He just says it's it's mega. It's just mega. I can't I can't wait to get there. Oh, goosebumps. Goosebumps. Yeah, all the yeah, way. We've got a couple of games to get there first, haven't we? So we've got a lot of hard work between now and then. So really excited. Yeah, well, to see well, the, fir- the first of them is this June, isn't it? We've actually got a test match against France. Yeah. Is that is yeah. that going to be for the Kielty Facility Cup, or is that is it just a test? From what I understand, I think one of them will be the uh, the Kielty Facility Cup. So, after uh, fetch that with us on the train over to France. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I forgot we had it then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've still got that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're exciting times. So we'll uh, we'll find out a lot about ourselves in our time in France, um, as we will do in Australia as well. So lo- lots of opportunity for us to grow that grow as a squad and, and, and grow further. Yeah, for, for those who don't know as well, there's a, a tour going on in October for Australia as well. It's a, like a, a, was it a week or, or more? I can't remember how long it's supposed to be for. It's um, looking like five games over a 14-day period, so really, really yeah. intense period for us given the jet lag and things like that. But what an experience that's going to be. and we're gonna, uh... Yeah, because we're going to be going go, go all over the place. Aren't they? They're going to uh, Brisbane, Ta- Townsville, uh, Townsville, Sydney, Sydney Wollongong. So yeah, yeah Wollongong, we'll be yeah. Miles block. So yeah, so uh, it's a three, three match test series like the old school Ashes and um, a couple of tour games in between against Queensland and New South Wales. So plenty of opportunity there for us to to put some vital miles on the clock. It's going to be exciting. Yeah, and I'm really happy that now we're doing. Um... Because this will be the first tour that we've done, like test match with Australia, isn't it? We, we've only ever yeah. played Australia in in a tournament. Yeah, and I, and I think we've only ever played France in in a test. Yeah, uh, it, it's quite nice to see that now Australia uh, banging on that door for it being com- competitive. I and mean, we saw them in the semi finals, how how well they're playing and how how good their kicking and passing game was. But like, what what's your opinions on over the last couple of years, England and France kind of being the dominance in teams kind of thing? Because it's I, I I know for a fact like the 2013 World Cup. I, I know you you were new at that time, but that at that time that was real. That really was two tournaments rolled into one kind of thing. The, with the, the, the levels being kind of different, but yeah, it was always, a, it's going to be England or France, or it's going to be France, or it's going to be England who, who win it. And, and it was like, almost like a second competition for third. Yeah. Like, what are your opinions on, on how that all comes off? Well, I think it's important. I think it was going over there um, for that three match test series is going to instantly improve them, isn't it? Because they're not, I think the trouble they've got in Australia, it's, it's not like us, is it, where we get to play France um, almost every year we get exposed to the top opposition, don't we? Every single year where in Australia you haven't got that luxury of this, so they're having to manipulate through um, origin and things like that. So um, bigger picture hat on, I think it's going to be going to be great for the game, us going over there, them being able to um, to kind of measure themselves against one of the top two sides in the world. So um, I think these tours are important for that reason. We want a strong Australia in there, don't we? Kind of yeah, well, we want a strong, we want a strong everyone, don't we? And that yeah, that that has to be the end goal. It, it looking in in the 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 sport point of view, as an England point of view, I, I, I'm, I'm happy as we are. But the as a a sport, we that's what we kind of need, don't we? It's, we want uh, six or seven teams capable of winning the competition at the end of the day, don't we? And and that that allows us to grow the sport globally, doesn't it? And domestically, and and um, finally realise its potential, I guess. So. Yeah, I think it's really important. Um, it's good to see Wales are improving year on year, aren't they? They gave us a tough time, didn't they, in the 2017 World Cup? It took us a long time yeah. to unlock. Them. So, they, they, they yeah, they were they were well ahead of us, weren't they? Until until like three quarters into the game, weren't they? We were we had to really pull something out to actually get one over on them for that game. That was a a massive surprise for us in as as England. 
But yeah, absolutely. Again, like yeah. we say about the sport, it's the, it's the best thing for it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. And and I mean, if Wales, you know, if Wales carry on the way they're going, it's it's going to be a couple of tough games for us, and it just puts us in a in a better stead, doesn't it, for twenty twenty one? So the more tougher games and the more tougher environments we can get um, get ourselves involved in, um, you know, it's going to be easier in twenty twenty one, isn't it? Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd just love to see in in the twenty twenty one World Cup that, that you know every every game you know within four points or something like that. If every game was like that, can you just imagine the? Yeah, it's like they go, we're going on BBC on the red button, aren't we? I know we're talking to Seb yesterday about it, but it that it'd just be awesome. Yeah, Again, and that's massively important. Yourself. Yeah. Yeah, and that's so hugely important, isn't it? That we've got more competitive, competitive teams than we haven't, isn't it? So if we can get all those close games, all those eyes, pairs of eyes on the BBC red button, it's just going to be massive, isn't it? You can see our sport in a good light. Yeah. So we've um, we've talked a lot about the the sport in general now, and um, I just wanted to get your predictions, your probably biased opinions on the predictions for the June game then against France. It's difficult to put my head on the block, isn't it? As a, <laughs> as a coach. Um, my predictions are it's going to be a real good, yeah, real good entertaining two games, I think. So, um, cop out. Cop out. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Cop out. I mean, uh, the backside's hurting from sitting on that fence, but uh, what I will say, it'll be a great occasion for both teams. And uh, yeah, looking forward to it. It is. So, and obviously, yeah, from on, our point sorry. of view as well, Lewis King on debut as well, so be exciting to see how he goes on it. So, be good. Yeah, it's great. I mean, the, the Lewis has um, done great, hasn't he, at England when he came, first turning up and and him him and James sort of gel really well, didn't they? Coming into a new a new foreign, not foreign, but uh, different setup kind of thing, and having to really adapt. And the he's got. Um, He's got a bright future, the lad has. I'm quite um, can't wait to play Argonauts. To be fair, to see the the difference in just what he takes back from the England camps. Yeah, and that's really important. And um, um, it's important that those guys take what they learn from the England camps into their club environments to try and improve. And like you say, the Argonauts were were really good, weren't they? Last year they took the the, uh, the Super League by by storm, didn't they? And I think this year, um, with a bit more structure, they're, they're going to improve, aren't they? So. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The club. The um, I mean, you only have to look at lead Le- the Le- uh, Leeds Rhino story, don't you? For five years ago, the the, the whipping boys of wheelchair rugby league who uh, getting getting hundred nil here, left, right, and centre, and and really struggling in in the sport, and always just kept putting their heads down, kept learning, kept learning for every every game or loss that they made. They always learn and. They yeah, got the players involved in England. Then that was the next step, and then they brought them away from that. What what's it been like for you to see um, the development of them players? Because obviously they joined when you became a, a head coach for England. What's it been like to see them grow from what you've seen them before you were head coach? Well, I think it's really exciting. I think um, for us to be successful at international level we need that domestic game really as strong as it can be can't we so I think the pleasing thing for me is is um, the development through the national program and taking it back to the club and playing their own version of that so what they've not done is just copied what goes on at England or they've not copied you guys who have dominated for a long time as Halifax have kind of took good bits from all different areas and made the Leeds Rhinos version of that and um, they're playing some really exciting stuff I mean how good is that Maybe not for yourself, but it was a great uh, <laughs> final to watch and, uh, and commentate on. Um, so the pleasing thing for me is exactly that template of people going into the international environment and taking some key learnings and improving their clubs. We need that across the board. So for a um, strong international game, we need that domestic game continuing to be strong, don't we? And and that continual sharing of good practice, be it through play. There's a lot of lessons to be learned from from Leeds and, and their story and how they've they've progressed and I, I can only I can only hope that well I, I'm pretty much sure that's what they're going to be they're going to be staying up at that top level the, the whole time just the 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 way in, in which they 
they are approaching the game and how they're structuring themselves and, and developing players and things like that. There's a lot of lessons that can be learned from them. Yeah. So, so the exciting thing for me is, um, you know, they've, they've risen the bar. So Halifax are going to go and try and raise the bar a little bit more, raise the bar and, and it's exciting from my point of view watching from the outsider. Really exciting. Yeah, that, that's one of the hard things for Wayne to take. Where I've said to Wayne, um, but this is the time now when all our lads are going to step up now. And if we... Yeah, we've we've had a loss, and now we can see where the mistakes are, and we can change them, and we can get better, and we can do this. We've we've got room for improvement. It's, it's quite difficult to to see where you need to improve when you're not losing, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, you've just got to find a way to improve, haven't you? And and try and yeah, it is a little bit more difficult, isn't it? So when you lose, you, you can kind of pick up two or three moments in a game, can't you? Or two or three patterns that you can improve upon, but. Yeah, it's kind of that growth mindset of, of being able to improve all the time and not being satisfied with what you've just delivered. So yeah, it's a tough challenge. It's a tough challenge. Yes. So just as a, a last question for you, can you give your top tip for player development before we, we call this a do? Um, top tip for player development. So what I guess it's most important. For most important. So if I'm going at it from a coaching perspective, so me talking, reaching out to other coaches, it's that invest some time in your players and really get to know them. Um, you know, have some trust in them that they, they've got a lot of answers in there and, and we should be down there telling them what to do. We should be trying to unpack that learning and, and getting them to understand uh, the game in, on their terms. So I think it's uh, from a coaching point of view, it's about it's about empowering your players and, and, and letting them um, go on a journey themselves and, and unpack what, playing good wheelchair rugby league looks like that's great mate but thank you for coming on the, yeah, on the podcast thanks for talking to us say that again it's a bit of a long-winded tip there but <laughs> nah, i don't mind it it's fine but um thank you for coming on mate it's been uh, great talking to you again we're going to be i'm going to be seeing you at the next england camp yeah in may not too long two or three weeks isn't it so yeah, just tell me the day before and i'll turn up don't worry yeah, definitely. Make sure you're uh, hung over as well. Yeah, I will do. <laughs> but, uh, Easy, mate. Thanks for talking to us, mate, and uh, I'll, I'll see you soon. See you soon. Take care, dude.